Hello, I'm Dirk Ducharme, Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief. Last month, Quality Digest CEO Jeff Dewar and I attended ASQ's World Conference on Quality and Improvement in Anaheim, California. We conducted several interviews with their two CEOs and both boards of directors. We think you're going to find these interviews pretty enlightening. We'd like to thank ASQ for making everyone available for our questions, and we hope these interviews will provide insight and support to our readers as they navigate the future, especially as it applies to their own careers. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Bland, Wanda, Teresa, thanks for joining us. Uh, we, we appreciate you taking the time uh, here at the end of the day. So I know you guys want to get out of here. Um, well, Bland, let's let's start with you. Um, you've been in the quality field a long time. A long time. I'm not saying anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't been that long. Um, and you've been you've been familiar with the ASQ for a long time, so you know that. Yeah, I'd say over the past 10 years, 15 years, uh, there was a fair amount of grumbling from certain sectors mm -hmm. of the ASQ membership about just where ASQ mm -hmm. was going, or and very often some of our audience were, were uh, uh, consultants, so they felt they were having to compete against the mm -hmm. ASQ, you know, even though they were members and that sort of thing, and, and a lot of our, our viewers will know that as well. But um, so. Now that the ASQ and ASQE are kind of all retooling and kind of on this, this great new journey, how are you revisiting those, uh, those complaints and, and addressing maybe kind of the past complaints? Well, the first thing is listen to them yep. and talk to the people and find out just what it is that they think they've lost and then talk about what they've gained. And, and so are you guys like actively seeking out and, and talking to like focus group kind of thing. I don't think or? we have to seek out. You just come to a meeting like this and, and <laughs> yeah. somehow they find you. Yeah, they, you get an earful, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> and, and many are very excited about what's happening and others are very worried. Um, you okay. know, they've been teaching a lot of courses, they've written books or whatever, and they want to know if they're still going to be part of that. So do you, do you think that there has been any kind of exodus of people from the quality field and, and and either through attrition you know just the, the old folks have retired and, and moved on uh, or maybe just a lack of interest I mean does it seem to be waning or is it growing it's going in every which way okay. because a lot of people have changed their title of what they're doing so data science is so hot hmm. and it's so closely related to quality sure. science that many people now have become data scientists because that's what the job offer was or what the advertisement was. It's funny, you know, you, you just mentioned something. We have actually have an article coming up. Uh, I can't remember who the author is offhand. Um, but he is talking exactly that. He says, you know, with the, with the, what's going on right, right now with data and data analysis, he says, really, you know, the quality professional in many ways has a lot of the same skills okay. as a data scientist, data analyst. You, you would agree with that? You're 100% right. Okay. And, and so some people have not really changed what they do. They've just changed the title of what they do. You know, we, Jeff and I, when we were talking to both uh, uh, Anne and, uh, and, and Jim earlier, um, that was kind of a topic that came up is really has the quality professional disappeared or if they just morphed into, into something else? I mean, what, 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 what do you guys think? Go ahead. I think they've they've morphed. I mean, I think the, the the quality professional is a very broad definition now. It's it's not in one industry. It's not one thing. Um, I myself have have a legal background and I work in customer operations, um, but I consider myself a quality professional. So I think what a quality professional is 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 very very wide. Um, I, I had a data analyst title at one time <laughs> and definitely consider myself a quality professional. So I, I think we don't need to cut quite those lines. Do you have quality in your title anywhere? The word quality is not in my title. Operational effectiveness is in my title, okay. but not the word quality. What, what, what about you? And, and the same for me. I don't have the word quality in my title at all. I'm uh, considered a change advisor. As far as change goes, to me, it's all about quality because 
as we make changes, we make improvements in our processes, in our business products, services that we provide, that's what's so important. And it, quality is such an integral part of that. And whether I'm called a quality person or not, I know that I have responsibility every day to deliver quality in what it is I do and what I deliver. And I think that's how a lot of people are now. I, I think it's changing and I think that's okay. I, I don't know that you have to have the quality word, but I think as long as you know and you're doing it, it's what really matters. Okay. And this, this really speaks to a broader mm -hmm. conversation about what's happening to the profession. And we have heard many, many times that the quality profession is being diminished, it's uh, going away, and what I'm hearing in your message is that it, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's just changing its colors. Uh, it was, it's, uh, more than that, it's not just a, a, a superficial change. There's fundamental changes going on, like the data scientist part, but, uh, but don't be misled by the absence of that one single word. Right. Yeah, I've been a member of ASQ for 48 years. I have been working in various areas of quality management for longer than that, and I've never, ever had quality in the title of any job I have. When anybody asks, I consider myself an applied statistician. Huh. I just happen to apply statistics to quality management and other yeah. things. I teach in the university a graduate course in Lean Six Sigma. I teach undergraduate courses on entrepreneurship. But I don't have in the university, it's just my title is just professor. Okay. Okay. Let, let's change gears here. Um, younger people. Last night at the mm -hmm. social, I had a conversation with a young man mm -hmm. in his mid-twenties that he asked me the same question that I had prepared to ask you. And he said, I just joined ASQ a couple of years ago. And what I need to know is what this society is doing for my generation. And, and so my question is, what's ASQ's view of how to attract the younger people and in particular take into account their expectations, and I'll add an extra word in there, and their dreams. Latin, why don't we start with you? Well, one thing we're doing, and we'll be doing it in the next couple of days, is strategic planning and, and really trying to divide up the members into the ones just coming in, the ones in the middle, and the ones that are more advanced, and really trying to understand what each of them needs. And, and then trying to also understand what do we need to help provide? You know, what are the challenges of the future? I mean, I work a lot in fibers and materials and things, and everything's being made out of carbon fiber now, like airplanes and cars and mm -hmm. sports gear and everything. We really know how to recycle aluminum. We know how to test aluminum. We know how aluminum stresses and cracks. I, you probably don't want to know that. We don't know that about carbon fiber, so we don't know when the wings are going to fall off your plane. <laughs> we know eventually they will, but, but how do we predict it, and how do we test it, and how do we predict the reliability of things that we've never made before? And so we have so many new things that are going to create jobs. I mean, machine learning is going to create an incredible amount of jobs, but. How do you test things inside the black box where a lot of the people who even have created the algorithms don't know how they work? Right. Yeah. Well, that's actually, that, that's kind of a, leads into kind of a question I had was, and you alluded to it, uh, the, the quality profession has, has changed quite a bit. I mean, the things that we, we I mean, it's gone from, you know, in, inspection to designing quality in, uh, you know, you get, you get the technology that has changed so much. You mentioned AI, machine learning, different materials. Um, What is ASQ doing, and I guess maybe educationally, I guess, to beef up their curricula to address some of these newer things that, uh, well, that Teresa and talking about. Juan can really answer this, but I'm going to jump in first. Okay. One thing is we're doing is really shorten the cycle on creating courses. It used sure. to take like two years to do a course and everything, and now at that time the technology's changed. Oh my gosh! And and we can deliver it electronically. Yeah. And, and deliver it in a way that we've never been able to do before. We're actually using the technology in the courses as well as to create them. And so we can take a new subject and we can bring in some of our subject matter experts because in the society we have so many people who are working in these fields and we can bring them in and create the material and get it out to the people who are just starting in these fields very quickly now. Right. We just have to figure out what it is they need. Yeah. Yeah, so I the, think the process is there. 
Yes, the process is there, and plus we have the knowledge somewhere in the society, but also tapping them and finding out who are the leaders in these new areas. Yeah, right, they can contribute to the, right. the curriculum, yeah. Right, and I think that's absolutely true, getting uh, different ones engaged that have that subject matter expertise, but then we also, uh, in putting the actual training together, we have a guy that's leading that now that is amazing and has uh, AI technology. And I was going through one of the courses recently, and there's a person, you think, standing there talking to you, training you in this course, and it's not. It, it's an, it, yeah, an it, avatar. It, it's an avatar, yeah, yeah. and she looks so real, and she is really engaging with you, and it's amazing what wow. that does. And it's... I think moving in, into this next um, level of technology that we're using to create the training is really going to make a difference. Yeah, you see yeah. that as well, right? No, absolutely. Um, I think that the micro learning, mm -hmm. the, the digital online learning, the, the speed, um, I think there's a lot of work going into taking those fundamentals of quality and how do we apply it to the concepts and the careers and so forth that, that these young people are going to be working in and aspire to. Um, so it's the, the, the fundamentals don't really necessarily change, but where they're applying it, how they're and applying how they're it, the it. context, yeah. Um, and I think outside of the traditional learning itself, I think mentoring is something we're talking a lot about. It's a, it's a hot topic, right? Oh. And, and really mentoring is circular, right? So um, Plan talked about those different generational yeah. groups, yeah. And, and we have we can all learn from each other. So I think you know establishing more and more of those mentoring relationships um, helps with the, the training and the learning and development as well. Yeah. Teresa is so right. The, the people that I teach, you know, who are between 18 and 22, and then the graduate students who are up to 30, they want to make a difference and they want to do something. So one thing I think we haven't done well enough is is really pouncing on the problems and telling people that they were really quality wrong. I mean, the fact that babies don't have formula right now is yeah. because yeah. the biggest plant was shut down because of quality problems. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That's Johnson & Johnson, yeah. one of the most famous companies yeah. in the country in medicine, yeah. can't get the vaccine right. Yeah. And nobody wants a J&J &J shot anymore. And, yeah. and you just look one thing after the other. I mean, Boeing, I mean, all people can't get a plane yeah, right, right. Off the ground, right? Yeah. I mean, we've really got to make it clear to these people, these are problems that quality professionals can solve. And then we have to go back and say, okay, now what should we have done and, and how do these things happen? And we know how to do these things. Why aren't we getting the right people in the right place at the right time? And these are the opportunities for you people. And, and does this speak to a broader issue of recruiting? Yes. Uh, you know, not just recruiting for a particular job position, mm -hmm. but recruiting young people to look at the broader quality or whether or not quality is in the word or not. But the principles of quality are in. So, you know, saying to young people, here is a career area for you right. that's got lots of subcategories. Is ASQ addressing some of that to, to make it more attractive? Yeah, if, I, if I could, I mean, one of the things that released recently, uh, maybe about two years ago now, recently in my head, <laughs> uh, was a pathways tool. Um, so now anybody going onto the ASQ site can say, okay, where am I in my career right now? What are my interests? What am I aspiring to? What are my experiences? And it will guide them to the right certification path that best matches their needs. Um, it's, it's a fairly simple you know, tool to walk through. Um, but I think even just that connecting the right people to what they need so they don't have to go, go read the, vol you know, the, the volumes to figure out um, helps, helps in that space. Um, you know, one thing we haven't, we haven't asked yet is, um, we talked, you know, we, we talked to the ASQE board, obviously, mm -hmm. and into Jim, and um, what they feel their the ASQE is bringing mm -hmm. to the table through uh, through their development and uh, expertise. What do, as the ASQ board, what do you see the ASQE bringing to the occasion, mm -hmm. uh, 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 
equation, sorry. So let, I'll start with that because on the technical community side, one of the th key things they're delivering for us is the insights on excellence mm -hmm. benchmarking uh, tool that they have and information. So far we have two years of data. I'm excited for the third year because mm -hmm. then we have three points and we can have a, we can have a trend, <laughs> right? Draw line. <laughs> Very nice. We can draw a little line and it'll work. Uh, yep, yeah, we'll have a curve and it will be awesome. But it is excellent in terms of helping the technical communities determine where they can focus and what's going to make a difference to members because the organizations are saying what's really important to them it's like we have a gap in this area and for two years now a couple of the gaps have been around uh, data and the use of data but also on the softer side around change how do we uh, deal with barriers or resistance to change in our organization and so the technical communities help to address those things and create content to do that. Uh, just another thing briefly I want to mention is helping the younger people get engaged in those kind of things. I'm hoping, and this is something for the future, not something we're doing right now, but I'm hoping that we can have those um, groups uh, organically form so that they uh, solidify around certain topics that are really important to them. If you look back uh, several years ago to Meg Wheatley's book where she talked about the aspen trees mm -hmm. and how, how they organically form and create communities and family, I want that for the, for the technical communities and then to engage with the geographic communities to make that available. Okay. And and this whole insights and excellence is just going to be such a database awesome. and, and just the connections to the companies. And we don't do a good job in public relations, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about in our strategic planning and everything. And I just want to start collecting, like, what are companies hiring, and what are they calling them, and, and why is the quality professional going to get these jobs? I mean, I get thank you notes from my graduate students who have taken a Six Sigma course because Tesla's hiring them like crazy oh, at very good jobs. So I'd love to have kind of a profile of Tesla. How many people have they hired that we would call quality professionals, no matter what title they give them? Yeah. And what are the opportunities in Tesla? And what are these people doing? And then the other thing is, what don't they know that they should? And how can we help them? And then going back to the career path, how can we provide them the skills to really succeed in a company like this? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. uh, in that document, there's a goal number one. Mm -hmm. It says, Not yet. <laughs> there will be soon. Well, it says drive thought leadership in excellence through quality. Oh, you're talking about the existing. So the existing. I'm one. thinking yeah. of the one that will happen next this week. <laughs> okay. All right. So, all right. So, I'm I'm dealing a little bit in the present. Um, there is an initiative. Mm -hmm. Quote: Develop a comprehensive content strategy that incorporates new and existing resources with a focus on that last three words, new and existing resources, what does that really mean? Well, one has been the whole e-learning and how, how we're getting that out there. The second, I think is just what Wanda was talking about, is this insights on excellence where we're really understanding what are we learning from the companies that we work with and support. And, and that's a, a huge, that database is a huge resource. Therese? Um, sure. I mean, when I think of, of both new and existing resources, I, I also, in addition, you know, I also think about um, all of the resources that the, the tech, well, I can't speak, the technical communities mm -hmm. have created over the years, all the, the bodies of knowledge that are still there, they're foundational and continue to be critically important. And it goes back again to how do we serve those up in an accessible way that different audiences can take the pieces they need from it and learn best from that. So maybe some of the content uh, at its core is very similar and existing, um, but it's maybe served up in, in different ways. Yeah. I'll give you one other. It's just the whole new way we're providing the education and teaching. Not just the online, but the actual people who will be able to use the materials and actually the human teachers that will go out. And so they'll have new opportunities and far better materials to teach anywhere but also for companies to be able to find these people that have already been verified and they've been accredited and these, these are instructors you'd want to have. We haven't been good at that before. Okay. 
All right. Well, oops, sorry. The, uh, Therese, let me uh, change direction again and ask you uh, about your particular role. So you're the chair of the ASQ uh, Diversity Inclusion Task Force. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is that? And <laughs> how do you plan on accomplishing your yeah. goals? Um, so it's a task force that um, was created under Austin Lynn when he was chair a couple of years ago. Um, and we've, we've continued it through. Um, it's really an ongoing work that, you know, while we have a task force, it's the work of the whole society. You know, a single task force can't make a society diverse and, and accepting and so forth. But what we saw, and, and some of this goes back even to, you know, Blan, when you were talking about the generations, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of it is generational, right? Um, but not just generational. We have um, a, a legacy of maybe not having as many women in the organization, maybe having not as diverse of, of ethnicity and cultural representation in the organization. Um, and there's, there's many, many, many forms of diversity, right? And, and so when we talk about sustaining and growing the organization for the future, um, certainly the younger generation expects psychological safety, mm -hmm. expects diversity, expects inclusion. Um, and, and we need all of those things, right? Um, and when you think about quality and you think about innovation, how do we, how do we get there if we're not diverse? If we're all thinking the same way, we're never going to innovate. So you're um, using the word diversity in the broadest possible context, I, I truly, not just demographic. I truly am. I mean, we certainly looked at, you know, we started with what are the demographics of the organization? Do we even know what the demographics of the organization <laughs> are? <laughs> and some of that data we do know, right? Um, but some of that data we, we don't. Yeah. We've never asked members to declare certain data points about themselves. Okay. <laughs> So, so some of it we have, some we don't have. Um, we then surveyed both the, the staff and the membership because we think about diversity in the broadest context of the society, not just members, but really the whole society, um, about what their impressions were of, you know, do they, do they feel like their opinions are valued? Do they feel like they can come to the table and, and share and so forth? Um, the, the results were, were, were pretty good compared to some benchmarks, but there were differences in different demographic cutdowns mm -hmm. of that data. So we know that there's opportunity. And, and what is that? What is that opportunity? I mean, I guess I, I can't visualize. Well, maybe I can. Is how does an organization like ASQ say, OK, well, we need to be more diverse. We need more, you know, we need a, a broader ethnic mix or, or whatever the diversity happens to be. How do you then? accomplish it? Do you reach out to those communities? I mean, what, what's the mechanism, I guess? And I, and I think it is where it takes the whole society, right? Um, I mean, there are some very tangible things we can do. And some of it is just having conversations, you know, not being afraid to have conversations. Some of it is things like we started a women in quality group, you know, sure. um, you think about in my in my workplace, we have something called employee resource groups, ERGs, and I'm sure most workplaces have something like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and those are areas where people can can collaborate, you know, people can find find like minded um, and also find allies. And so the women in quality, I think of very similarly. Um, we can do more of that in, in more, more groups. I think of it, some of it is very intentionally looking for who are the next leaders who bring diversity to the table and how do we grow them and develop them so that they're ready for that. You know, not just forcing people in, but so that they're really ready to perform. And that example she gave is one of a big success. That was one of our best conferences in the last Absolutely. couple of years. It's it's women women in quality. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll give you another example. How many people attended that, by the way? Oh, gosh, I don't know the number. I don't. I don't um, but it started in the all virtual world. <laughs> yep. and, and it's run twice now. And yes, yeah, it's been highly successful, but I don't know the number. It was, it was several hundred. Several yeah. hundred. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, I don't yeah. remember yeah. the number. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll give you another easy one. We want to have more young people. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, yeah, and so we need a feeder group. So we need to really get our student chapters up. Yeah. And they're very small and very inactive compared to some other societies that started a little earlier doing the same thing. I, I'm also part of another one that has 990,000 student members now. And if we just had 10% of that, we would have more than enough young people coming in because a lot of the student members get interested. They get obviously educated. They get, they know what it is and they see the opportunities and then they become members. 
And that's something we've been talking about. And I don't know how many members that we have now who are in academia have come up to me during this conference and said, we want to be part of that. You know, um, because we haven't actually talked about it in a, in a long time, um, how involved is ASQ in education? And I guess uh, I remember I remember Quality Kids, and I remember some other initiatives mm -hmm. that ASQ had that may, were specifically to reach into uh, a younger age group. And I'm just not familiar with what what's going on right now anymore with any kind of outreach. Not enough. Not enough. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Be honest. But but I think we had more some of that this yeah, week. We really. did. Um, yeah. We have student branches. We have Next Gen Committee. We have we have efforts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an area we need to continue to more, expand more on. Is it safe to assume that we can expect to see that in the forthcoming strategic plan? Yes. You can definitely see growing our membership, and you can definitely see growing this population as part of it. Okay. And using the resources we already have, we have a lot of members who are teaching in very good universities and who really want to contribute to this, but they also want materials. I mean, one of the things mm -hmm. that sure. uh, I talked about in my talk last night of, of some of these tapes that we have sitting around and everything, putting them in digital form for people to use clips of and, and to, to share materials we have, yeah. open source with teachers. Yeah. Yeah. And if they use them in the class and they start doing this and we're supporting them, they're talking to their students, their students are getting curious and calling us. Yeah. One of the things just to kind of make this very tangible is that the member leader meeting that we had on Monday, I'm losing track of days here. I thought it was Sunday. Yeah. Well, oh, Sunday. It was on Sunday. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Earlier, earlier this, this week, um, we shared the topic that, uh, or I started one of the, the meetings with um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion moment. Mm -hmm. So if you, and you can do different topics. So this one, because we were talking to leaders, happened to be on leadership. But they can run the gamut of what are key topics around either diversity, equity, or inclusion. Teresa's committee put together a great presentation that had different snapshots of what do the, these things mean? What does it mean for ASQ? How can you be engaged with it? So we've used those. We've also used uh, several other um, different, um, I, I guess you would call them gurus in that area around culture to, to really look at what some of those things are and how can we do better then and then cascade that through the organization. So it seems to be working. It's not totally working yet because, you know, as you cascade things, you have that Right. That issue sometimes that it doesn't get all the way to where it needs to, but we're working on that. And I'm I'm very excited that people are looking at different ways that they can share the topic of yeah. DE and I. Well, I think what one is doing is giving you some great examples of how we get the society to change. Is our member leaders are to change agents? They're the leading. They're running sections. They're running uh, things in their own community and their own companies, yeah. and finding out what they need. And, and diversity and inclusion is a big topic everywhere. Equity is, is huge. And, and to give them some skills that they can take back. And, and then finding things in other places that we can bring in. We've talked about change. We talk about how hard it is to implement. There's a new society, at, what, four years old now? Global Society for Implementation Science. There are all these people studying implementation yeah. And having international conferences and writing books, bringing them in because so many of our members talk about, well, we've solved the problem, but nobody used the solution. Right, right, right. <laughs> the whole implementation aspect. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. All right, last question. And I want to ask the same question to all three of you. Blanton, we'll start with you. Okay. In five words or less, what is the future of the quality profession? Major impact on critical problems. Hmm. Okay. Very good. Therese? I don't know that I can beat that. <laughs> it is a competition, right? Uh, socially responsible, innovative solutions. I like that. Okay. You got it to four. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Three now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no. Um, 
quality is everywhere. Yes. And, and there you go. That's three <laughs> words. Yeah. I was going to keep everywhere. going, but I'm going to stop. Simple, <laughs> if we keep going down the line. We'll have one <laughs> it'll word. be one word. Right. <laughs> I was going to say one. But but that is certainly quality is everywhere is a theme in all five interviews that we've done today. Good. Good. Uh, Blanton Godfrey, Wanda Sturm, Therese Steiner, ASQ Board of Directors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very oh, good. That fun. was fun. It was fun.